All right, let's get down to it. Let's talk about love and adultery. When we last left our hero, Gawain, he had galloped forth boldly to meet what he was pretty sure was going to be his death, because remember, we are talking about the poem Gawain and the Green Knight. It's one of the triumphs of Middle English literature, and it begins with a, a, surely one of the greatest openings in all of poetry, uh, probably all of literature for full stop, and that is this big green, handsome knight who rides into King Arthur's court, challenges anybody who wants to to take a blow at him. Uh, Gawain rises up, the young uh, golden boy, the golden boy versus the green knight, and uh, cuts the guy's head off. The guy picks his head up and says, see you in a year, pal. Um, and so Gawain is bound by his chivalric honor to go forth uh, and to ride forth against the green knight. When we last left him, he had prayed in the cold of winter for some kind of shelter, and he found a castle, which is going to turn out to be the castle of Bertilak, Lord Bertilak and his lady. Um, and so this is the, our opportunity to talk about sex in this poem before we get to the thrilling conclusion of the whole thing. Those of you who are watching, I am still wearing my green shirt. I don't usually wear two shirts, uh, the same shirt, two episodes in a row, but it's Gawain and the Green Knight, so I have to be wearing green the whole time. Before I start reading and talking to you about the situation that Gawain encounters in this castle, and remember that this is really getting up to the point when he's going to have to face the Green Knight, um, and it's it's an incredible tension builder because we're all waiting to know what's going to happen in that confrontation, and then suddenly it's, there's actually a really long drama between Lord and Lady Bertilak and Gawain, and it is all based on uh, this notion of what we now call courtly love, that is, the love that takes place among the elites, the upper crust, and the courts. Initially, this is a separate literary tradition from the literary tradition that celebrates sort of knights and the chivalric code. In something like the Chanson de Roland, which is part of the Matière de France, right, this is the, um, the French story from the 11th century about knighthood, or in something like Beowulf, for example, which is pre-chivalric ideals, but still deals with warriors and all that stuff. Um, Love is not really like a big plot line, you know. The, the ladies have a role to play, an elevated role to play, um, and it's not as if love doesn't exist in those worlds. Um, but the tradition of knightly and and of martial literature um, exists kind of independently uh, and at first uh, from this tradition that starts to grow up of writing uh, literature and poems about love affairs. And so I'm going to talk now. Last time I talked about how the the, the martial spirit of men got civilized by the church and by the English kings, um, and, in, and also by France. Remember, that this all, a lot of this originates in, in France. Now I'm going to talk about how the impulse to think and talk and write about love and sex got civilized and incorporated into um, this grand project of building rules for the nobility. And it's almost like you're building, you know, there, at this point, uh, we are dealing in with the kind of development and eventual dying out of like fe what is co called feudalism. Right, and so to talk about a middle class is a little bit anachronistic, but it's almost like you're creating uh, a nobility that is not the um, that is that is not the sort of titled lords and and ladies. The the technical term for this is gentry. So you're kind of creating rules for that level of society, um, and so we're going to get into talking about how courtly love becomes a thing and what it is. Now, Gawain and the Green Knight is in Middle English, but a lot of the stuff that comes before it, it was in Latin. And Latin and Ancient Greek are really languages that you need to learn to get really full-on deep into the Western tradition. The Ancient Language Institute is the place I recommend you go to do that. They are gearing up for their fall semester. They do an amazing job of teaching these languages as living languages, not just stuff you find in books. You're going to be reading and even listening and talking in these languages very, very quickly no matter how much of a beginner you are. Also new this fall is their Biblical Hebrew course. Now, I really think it's worth learning Biblical Hebrew. It used to be a much regular thing to do. Now it's kind of fallen out of favor. But one of the great things about Ancient Language Institute is that they teach these things from a much older and I think more sound perspective. These are all classical languages. Biblical Hebrew is an incredible addition to your spirit, spiritual life, to your literary life. If you are at all interested in learning any of these languages, Latin, Greek, or Hebrew, go to ancientlanguage.com slash 
heretics, and you can get 15% off the fall semester with the code heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, just like in the title. You can be a beginner, you can be a little bit along the way, you can be very advanced. They can help you no matter where you are, and their online classes are so, so good. So go to ancientlanguage.com slash heretics, get 15% off with the code heretics, and learn how you can go deeper into the Western tradition. Now, you will not be surprised to learn that a focus on love and romance in Western literature that is after antiquity, because there's plenty of love and romance in, in ancient Greek and Roman literature. Um, but in, in the medieval period and in uh, the early modern period, the focus on love comes to us from La France. This is the, you know, part of why the French get this reputation for being these great lovers, right? Um, it, it goes way, way back. In medieval France, you have two regions. They are called the Languedoc in the south and the Languedoc in the north. Um, and long in, in French means tongue, speech, uh, language. And uh, this is referring to the fact that they speak two often even unintelligible, mutually unintelligible languages. This is a French, uh, different forms of French that are very, very different from one another. Um, and these two names refer to the different ways that you say yes in these two languages. So in the south, when you say yes, you say ok, and that's why it's the longa duck. And in the north, when you say yes, you say oil, and that's why it's the longa doi. Um, and if you can hear it, right, oi eventually becomes our modern French oui. And so it's the north, which is the longa doi, that kind of wins out. That's where the, you know, the English kings are going to uh, come from after the Norman conquest, all of this stuff. Um, but in the South, there is kind of a distinct culture in this, and it's, this is still true, right? The South of France is very distinct. It's very beautiful. You can go sunbathe there, yada, yada. Um, but it looks across the Pyrenees to Spain. Uh, and there's a lot going on in Spain that's kind of different from what's going on in the rest of Europe, which is becoming integrated into Christendom, as I talked about last time. Spain had been conquered by Muslims, and so there was a, there was a strong Muslim culture. Um, and in the time that I am talking about, that is the kind of 9th century, 10th, 11th century, um, basically that culture fragments into a bunch of smaller kingdoms, some of which are Christian, but many of which remain Muslim. And so Muslim music and culture, uh, as well as what's going on in the this, this Christian Spanish kingdoms, come over the Pyrenees into France in a number of uh, major cultural centers, one of which is Aquitaine. And Aquitaine uh, is, is how this all gets basically exported to England because um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who's the Eleanor of, the, of Shakespeare's King John and the mother of all these, uh, you know, incredible royals, right? She was the mother of Richard Lionheart uh, and of his brother, King John, who was the, like more of a disastrous king, right? Um, but she herself is this incredible battle axe, just a like force to be reckoned with. Um, and she began, she was first married um, to Louis Louis the seventh of France. Um, and it was only after that that she married Henry the second of England. Um, this is a woman who's living in the in the 12th century. But her court in Aquitaine, where she sort of began, um, was a major center for this kind of uh, Spanish music that was coming over and that was about love. Um, and so she basically, you know, she and her uh, daughter from her first marriage, Marie, Marie of Champagne, um, were very interested patrons of the arts, and patronage was a hugely important thing for artists at this time because it was not like you could just like write a book and make a bunch of money. You had to have somebody that would uh, feed you and uh, give you a living while you did your brilliant uh, work. And nobles liked to do this. They liked to do this because it made them look good and sophisticated and rich and powerful, but also art is great. It's great to have art, and if you have money, you can buy art. Uh, so, during this time, um, there is this kind of flowering of the um, Muslim, Spanish uh, musical and literary tradition that moves through the south of France up into England. And in part, I think probably because these are powerful women who are who are patronizing it, um, they're interested in hearing about love stories. Um, and they're interested in hearing about stories in which women have this role and agency. One of the interesting things about courtly love from the very beginning is it gives women power uh, to either make or break the life of a man. Because uh, the, the tradition is basically that a man is pining after this elevated noble woman, um, just, you know, 
absolutely, you know, beautiful beyond words. We talked about this trope when we talked about Petrarch, right? And this is kind of the um, eventual development of this into the sonnet form. This is part of where that idea comes from, um, are these stories about men who pine after women that they can't have. And this is where we get into this very complicated and for us quite surprising and foreign element of things, which is that there's a, a, a hugely adulterous component to courtly love. And um, courtly love really gets kind of rollicking on, really gets going um, with these stories about men who can't have women because they're married. Now, one feature of this is that marriage at this point is uh, as much an economic and uh, cultural sort of power relationship as it is a love relationship. Um, and so the, 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 the relationship that you choose, even in spite of uh, social norms, even in spite of morality that you can't control, right? That's the passion of that is very exciting and interesting. And, and there's, again, just like uh, martial uh, spirit, just like fighting in war. This is something that we can't do away with. And so the church is going to have to figure out some way not to just say, well, you know, don't be interested in this, but to temper it and to, uh, to contain it and to control it. Because of course, adultery is, you know, anti-scriptural. Um, it's disastrous, especially for children. Um, and yet, nevertheless, we're fallen, we're broken. We have this kind of prurient interest in it. Um, and there is an undeniable romance and excitement to hearing about these men that pine after these unattainable, unattainable women. And so one reason why, one kind of story that we're telling here is how this sort of naughty uh, way of doing things gets civilized into the, oh, well, I pine after you from afar, the way that I pine after Mary, for example. Example. Um, but you know, I do not, I do not uh, touch you. And this is what it's gonna, what's gonna come to be the sort of story or the main tension and drama of Gawain. Hey, it is so hard these days, even just to like exist in the world without being watched over and preyed upon by big tech. But one great way to protect yourself is Express VPN. Think for a second about all the stuff that you do on the internet. Everything you browse, you search, you watch you tweet. Now imagine that all of that data is being crawled through by data brokers, aggregators, right, whose sole business is to buy and sell your data. They don't have to tell you. They don't have to give you your consent. They can pretend that what you're doing is private. It is not. You are being watched over by these guys, and they're such creeps. So with ExpressVPN, my connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server, and this means that my IP address, which is one of the big data points that they look for, my IP address is masked. Every time I turn ExpressVPN on, I'm given a random IP address shared by other ExpressVPN customers. It's like an I am Spartacus moment, right? They can't find you because you all have the same IP address. The best part is how easy it is to use. Any device, phone, laptop, smart TV, whatever, just tap one button and you are protected with ExpressVPN. I highly recommend that you join me in protecting your data. It is your business. Go to expressvpn.com slash heretics to get three extra months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash heretics because you know I love giving you free stuff three months for free at expressvpn.com slash heretics. Okay, I'm going to read one kind of important text from this period by a fellow named Andreas the Chaplain. And now Andreas is under the patronage of Marie of Champagne. Remember, that's Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter from her first marriage. And he writes this book, The Art of Courtly Love, which is kind of a reboot of Ovid. And we haven't actually done an episode on Ovid yet, but this is a poet under in the Augustan era, um, famously exiled for what he said was a poem and a mistake. Um, and so it's a great model for a chaplain under noble patronage uh, trying to write about love and sex. And what's remarkable is that this is a chaplain writing about uh, this tradition, which includes this sort of adulterous component. Um, and so throughout the whole book, it's kind of like, well, what the heck is going on here? In book three, uh, he, takes, he takes it all back, uh, which is kind of remarkable given that he could have just not written it in the first place. And so I want to read just from the opening of when he starts taking it all back. And he says, friend, he's been addressing it to his friend Walter. 
if you will lend attentive ears to those things which after careful consideration we wrote down for you because you urged us so strongly, you can lack nothing in the art of love. This is a handbook, pick up lines, all that stuff, right? Um, since in this little book we gave you the theory of the subject fully and completely being willing to accede to your requests because of the great love we have for you. You should know that we did not do this because we consider it advisable for you or any other man to fall in love, but for fear lest you might think us stupid. We believe, though, that any man who devotes his effort to love loses all his usefulness. Read this little book, then, not as one seeking to take up the life of a lover, but that, invigorated by the theory and trained to excite the minds of women to love, you may, by refraining from so doing, win an eternal recompense and thereby deserve a greater reward from God. For God is more pleased with a man who is able to sin and does not than with a man who has no opportunity to sin. Now, I want to be careful here because I believe with the church that adultery is a terrible, family-destroying, life-destroying thing. I think that now, in our sort of extreme promiscuity and our just, like, anything-goes kind of mentality, or what you would call the Nicki Minaj mentality, right, of just, like, sex everywhere all the time, uh, we've left so many children fatherless, right, an unprecedented number of children without, without fathers, uh, and the disastrous effects of this are everywhere to be seen in our society, from the sort of weak, woke men who pander to the social justice dogma, all the way to the streets um, where, where men lash out with no guidance. You know, they don't have any of that guidance that we've been talking about how to channel their energies because of fatherlessness. So it's not at all that I mean to suggest that winking at that is like funny or good. But I think that Andreas and the church in general here is being very, very sly. That is, we think of, of church morality as prudishness, right? We think of it as just like, uh, you know, don't do that because sex is bad. And, you know, there are, like everything, the church goes wrong and the church does talk that way sometimes. Uh, and pastors can sound a little bit like they just don't want you to have any fun. But in reality, right, the, the truth of this morality is like, well, it's, 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 it's not going to work out well to do, to just have sex with everyone all the time. Um, and so the, this version of church morality, the Andreas the Chaplin version, is kind of like, yeah, I'm not dumb. I know that this is something that's on your mind. I read. I, I know that this is on everybody's mind. Uh, and that this tradition of literature is very exciting for people. Um, and, and that even, it, you know, it even made its way into the Arthurian legends. Because Chrétien de Troyes, whom we talked about last time, uh, who really kind of made Arthur uh, like one of the, the a really big thing, um, one of his major innovations was to invent the character of Lancelot, who brings courtly love and courtly adultery into Arthur, because Lancelot is the guy that sort of falls in love with Guinevere, who's Arthur's queen, um, and in The Knight of the Cart, which is one of the most famous Chrétien um, pieces, uh, this is a, sort of about uh, Lancelot and Guinevere sneaking off together. And so Andrea is saying, I'm not dumb. I know that this is an urge that people have. I'm just, all I'm saying is that resisting it will bring you greater rewards and make you happier. And so by, by acknowledging it, by writing a whole book about it, and then saying, actually what you need is to use these literary endeavors as a way of getting this off your chest and then devote yourself to God and to piety and to chastity, right? He's, he's, he's doing something that I think is much more effective. So you say, yeah, write books about it, tell stories about it, think about it, um, laugh at it. It's a kind of cathartic form of, of, of literature. I get that. Um, but then use that in your life as a way of understanding, like always do that in a context of knowing that the moral world is actually quite real and stuff that seems fun in fantasy doesn't work out in, in real life. All of this, I think, all of the tension and the sexiness and the potential for hypocrisy, but the, you know, the truth of the ideals is basically gathered up into, the, into Gawain, into Gawain and the Green Knight. Because the next thing that happens is that in Bertilac's castle, uh, there is a game, another game worked out before Gawain goes on to face his green foe. And the basic rule of the game is Gawain will stay in the castle. Bertilac will go out hunting. And Gawain will get everything that Bertilac wins out on the hunt. And Bertilac will get everything that Gawain wins or gains uh, in the castle. This sounds a bit strange until we realize what's about to happen, which is that Lady Bertilac is going to try to seduce Gawain. Um, and she's doing this 
with an awareness that this is what courtly literature sort of expects. We sort of expect courtly love, right? To, to be the knight falls in love with the lady of the house. Um, and she tries very, very hard and very frankly to seduce him. So we're going to read now some of those passages um, and see that none of this is prudery, right? It's unblushing. It's incredibly sexy. Um, it just ultimately has a, has, a, has a religious and moral conscience, which has been infused into it by the church over these many centuries. So fit three, remember there are four fits, four parts of this poem, uh, begins with Bertillac off hunting. Uh, and there are these amazing sort of shifts and focus back from these hunting scenes, which are, I mean, the, hunting was the elite pastime. The king of England had woods to himself for hunting. Um, and so this was, you know, nobles were supposed to hunt. It, there was an art to it. Uh, there was an art to how you, there still is an art to how you, you know, disembowel a deer and prepare the meat and all of this stuff. And this poem is is like celebrating that while it is also telling the story of, of Lady Bertillac and Gowan. So... Well before sunrise, the servants were stirring. The guests who were going had called for their grooms, and they scurried to the stables to ready the steeds, trussing and tying all the trammel and tack. The high-ranking nobles got ready to ride, jumped stylishly to their saddles, and seized the reins. They cantered away on their chosen courses. The lord of that land was by no means last to be rigged out for riding with the rest of his men. After mass, he wolfed down a meal, then made for the hunting grounds with his hunting horn. So as morning was lifting its lamp to the land, his lordship and his huntsmen were high on horseback, and the canny kennel men had coupled the hounds and opened the cages and called them out. On the bugles they blew three bellowing notes to a din of baying and barking, and the dogs which chased or wandered were chastened by whip. As I heard it, we're talking a hundred top hunters at least. The handlers hold their hounds, the huntsmen's hounds run free. Each bugle blast rebounds between the trunks of trees. As the cry went up, the wild creatures quaked. The deer in the dale, quivering with dread, hurtled to high ground, but were headed off by the ring of beaters who bawled and roared. The stags of the herd with their high-branched high heads and the broad-horned bucks were allowed to pass by, for the lord of the land had laid down a law that man should not maim the male in close season. But the hinds were halted with hollers and whoops, and the din drove the does to sprint for the dells. Then the eye can see that the air is all arrows, and all across the forest they flashed and flickered, biting through hides with their broad heads. What? They bleat as they bleed, and they die on the banks, and always the hounds are hard on their heels, and the hunters on horseback come hammering behind with stone-splitting cries, as if cliffs had collapsed, and all those animals which escaped the aim of the archers were steered from the slopes down to rivers and streams, and set upon and seized at the stations below. So perfect and practiced were the men at their posts, and so great were the greyhounds which grappled with the deer, that prey was pounced on and dispatched with speed and force. The Lord's heart leaps with life. Now on, now off his horse. All day he hacks and drives, and dusk comes in due course. So that's the hunting. That's one half of this fit, right? And out there, they're, you know, they're, they're doing this, like, noble pursuit. And inside, Gawain is being pursued himself by the Lady Bertillac. And so while he sleeps, she's constantly coming and presenting herself to him. And she does this again and again, and she's very insistent. And he... Um, kind of resists the stereotype of the knight. That this is the amazing thing, right, is that the author knows that the thing is that the knight uh, sleeps with the, with the Lord's lady, um, but Gawain is, is aspiring to something higher. He's aspiring to a more chaste form of adoration uh, of this woman, of Mary, of all of this, of all of this stuff. And so uh, the poet is basically saying, at this point, the church has civilized these men so that they have ideals that are higher than just running off with, with the lady. So... She approaches the curtains, parts them, and peeps in, at which Sir Gawain makes her welcome at once, and with prompt speech she replies to the prince, settling by his side and giggling sweetly, looking at him lovingly before launching her words. If this is Gawain who greets me, I am galled that a man so dedicated to doing his duty cannot heed the first rule of honorable behavior, which has entered through one ear and exited the other. You have already lost what last yesterday you learned in the truest lesson my tongue could teach." What lesson, asks the knight, I know of none. Though if discourtesy has occurred, then correct me, of course. I encouraged you to kiss, the lady said kindly, and to claim one quickly when one is required, an act which ennobles any knight worth the name. Dear lady, said the other, don't think such a thing. I dare not kiss, in case I am declined. If refused, I'd be at fault for offering in the first place. 
In truth, she told him, you cannot be turned down. If someone were so snooty as to snub your advance, a man like you has the means of his muscles. That's an amazing, I mean, oh my gosh, she's basically inviting him to pin her down, right? Uh, yes, by God, said Gawain, what you say holds good, but such heavy handedness is frowned on in my homeland, and so is any gift not given with grace. What kiss you request, I will courteously supply, have what you want or hold off, whichever the case. So bending from above, the fair one kissed his face, the two then talk of love, its grief, also its grace. The, the melding of moods here is so amazing. It's, it's, it's incredibly sexy. There's a ton of sexual tension. But then there's this, uh, this reservation that Gawain has that has imposed itself into the sort of stock narrative, into the stock narrative of courtly love, which is that the knight runs away with the lady. Now Gawain says, it is frowned upon in my homeland to take women by force. Let me say something here about this, because, of course... Uh, the travesty, the horror that is rape and sexual abuse is very much in the news these days. And toxic masculinity is regularly blamed for the fact that there exist cads and low lives who take advantage of, of women. Nothing could be further from the truth. In this poem, in that one sentence where Gawain says, you don't take women by force where I come from, not in King Arthur's court, the whole weight of history and civilization and these long, grinding, slow developments that have served to civilize the warring class. The whole weight comes bearing down and says, thou shalt not. And this whole idea that a woman's will, a woman's free will, is sacrosanct and inviolate, that comes to us from nowhere other than this tradition. So, of course, of course, it's an evil, horrible thing to take advantage of a woman. But the, the great insight of chivalric literature is that it's also an unmanly thing, that the manly thing to do is to civilize your impulses and to, and to take the woman's lead, right? And so in a genius move, right, the church takes this tradition, which puts the woman in power because she can say yes or no, and turns it into a law of the man's heart that you are noble and elevated if you do not take women by force. Because, of course, that was a thing that soldiers did all the time, right? Um, and now here we have the grand genius innovation of the church um, to, to put an end to that and to put an end uh, to, to, to sexual immorality. And so to tear that down in the name somehow of women's autonomy is to get things exactly backwards. This is what's so tragic about the excesses of something like the Me Too movement. Sure, yes, men behave terribly, but they behave terribly when you take away from them their manly nobility, their chivalric code, their ideals, right? When you take those things away or when you sniff at them and you frown on them and you laugh at them because they don't always, because people don't always live up to them, right? When you make men feel small because they can't be the knights that they long in their hearts to be, instead of inviting them, right, to get bigger, better, stronger, faster in, in pursuit of that ideal, when you cut all that away, then, then you have chaos. So this is the thing that I, that I want to say about sexual mores, right, in the chivalric world, is that human beings evolve and grow and develop over time. And when you, when you scoff at that because you think you're beyond all of it in modernity, you are inviting, you are inviting all of the worst excesses of humanity to come flooding back against the, the pillars and the walls that have been erected by the church and the state over time. This goes on for a while in the Gawain poem. There's a lot of it. It's really fun and entertaining. I'm going to read one more passage, and then I'm going to say kind of what happens next. That noble princess pushed him and pressed him, nudged him ever nearer to a limit where he needed to allow her love or impolitely reject it. He was careful to be courteous and avoid uncouthness, cautious that his conduct might be classed as sinful and counted as betrayal by the keeper of the castle. I shall not succumb, he swore to himself. With affectionate laughter, he fenced and deflected all the loving phrases which leapt from her lips. You shall bear the blame, said the beautiful one, if you feel no love for the female you lie with and wound her more than anyone on earth to the heart, unless, of course, there is a lady in your life to whom you are tied and so tightly attached that you could not begin to break the bond. So in honesty and trust, now tell the truth. For the sake of all love, don't be secretive or speak with guile. You judge wrong by St. John, he said to her and smiled. There is no other one and won't be for a while. Those words, said the woman, are the worst insult. But I asked and you answered, and now I ache. 
Kiss me warmly, and then I will walk in the world in mourning like a lady who loved too much. Stooping and sighing, she kisses him sweetly, then withdraws from his side, saying as she stands, But before we part, will you find me some small favor? Will you give me some gift, a glove at least, that might leaven my loss when we meet in my memory? Well, it were, said Gawain. I wish I had here my most priceless possession as a present for your sweetness, for over and over you deserve and are owed the highest prize I could hope to offer, but I would not wish on you a worthless token, and it strikes me as unseemly that you should receive nothing greater than a glove as a keepsake from Gawain. I am here on an errand in an unknown land, without men bearing bags of beautiful gifts, which I greatly regret through my regard for you, but man must live by his means and neither mope or moan. The pretty one replies, Nay, noble knight, you mean you'll pass to me no prize, no matter. Here is mine. She offers him a ring of rich red gold, and the stunning stones that upon it stood proud, beaming and burning with the brightness of the sun. What wealth it was worth you can well imagine, but he would not accept it and said straight away, By God, no tokens will I take at this time. I have nothing to give, so nothing will I gain. She insists he receives it, but still he resists, and swears on his name as a knight to say no. Snubbed by his decision, she said to him then, you refuse my ring because you find it too fine, and don't dare to be deeply indebted to me. So I give you my girdle, a lesser thing to gain. From around her body she unbuckled the belt, which tightened the tunic beneath her top coat, a green silk girdle trimmed with gold, exquisitely edged and hemmed by hand, and she sweetly beseeched Sir Gawain to receive it, in spite of its slightness, and hoped he would accept. But still he maintained he intended to take neither gold nor girdle, until by God's grace the challenge he had chosen was finally achieved. With apologies, I pray, you are not displeased, but I must firmly dis refuse you no matter how flattered I am. For all your grace I owe, a thousand thank yous, man. I shall, through sun and snow, remain your loyal man. So, at this point, basically my entire kitchen is stocked with stuff from public goods. Y'all know that I'm kind of a health nut. Nutrition is a huge part of that, and when I buy stuff from public goods, I just know that there's no gross additives, no weird preservatives, all that stuff that you might get at the grocery store, and it's not, like, super expensive. You think of, you know, cleaner, better stuff as being really high-end, really pricey. It's really not, uh, but it is very attractive. So I, like, fiend on their almonds all the time, and they look great in my pantry, but then there's also, like, soap and basics and for bathroom, too, right? And it all looks so good because they just have this great, clean design really love public goods and they have given me this incredible like stupidly good deal like it's kind of crazy um if you go to publicgoods.com slash heretics or use the code heretics you can literally just get free stuff you get 15 dollars off of your first public goods order with no minimum purchase so that means that if you spend if you buy 15 dollars worth of stuff right you get it for no dollars <laughs> that's stuff for no dollars. And it's good stuff. So go to publicgoods.com forward slash heretics. P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash heretics. Get $15 off your first order. It would be dumb not to do that. Okay. The drama of this set of interaction between Gawain and Lady Bertilak is, like, it sets your hair on fire. Because she's, I mean, so at his feet, right? She completely just, like offers herself to him. She's a very beautiful woman. If you know anything about the male libido, you know what it costs Gawain to say no, right? Because it's fine to read about it. Oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's an old poem, blah, blah, blah. But, right, like, in, 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 in the moment, right, the reason why you need these strict moral codes is because in the moment, it's very, very tempting, right? And you can tell that Gawain, has, there's this longing between them. Gawain wants, of course, to please her and is almost caught by his desire to... Uh, to be deferent to her, unto the point even of, of what he considers a sin, what is a sin. Um, but he resists, and he resists in, a, in this incredibly noble and admirable way, but he doesn't resist all the way, because when she offers him the green girdle, she finally explains to him that it will protect his life, that it has, a, it has magic in it that will make it impossible for him to be killed. And so finally, finally, he succumbs, and he accepts the green girdle. And this is, to him... A terrible failure. We're going to get into a moment for why it's not really that bad for everybody else. Everybody else is kind of like, this seems fine. Um, you're about to go up against your death. This is a good solution. It's not like you're having sex with this woman. She's just giving you her belt. But for him, right, you have to understand that for him, nothing less than perfection is good. And 
of course that means angst and anguish. It does for all of us, right? Having, having ideals that are unattainable, that are unattainably perfect, means getting down on yourself sometimes when you fall short, right? It also means, of course, seeking the forgiveness of God and understanding that you're human, and that's part of this poem too, as we'll get to in a moment, right? Um, but the pain of that, which is self-generated, right? Gawain feels it because he wants he wants to live up to his ideals. He wants to live up to, to Mary, right? Um, and he's taken this belt, uh, which is basically a kind of wavering, a kind of weakness um, in the face of this beautiful lady who's offering him something he so, so desires. But there's going to be, uh, and this is a spoiler alert, there's going to be a twist ending that kind of uh, brings all of this together and ties it up into a final, a very, I think, satisfying conclusion. Gawain goes off to the Green Chapel where the green knight is to be found. And before that, he, he confesses, he cleans his heart, and he says, I trust in God. Um, there's a problem, right? Because he's also trusting in the green girdle. And so that itself, at this point, Gawain, uh, in his purity, has been compromised, right? He's been, he's been so, so uh, diligent and valorous all the way up to this point. And now there's just this little impurity, there's this little flaw uh, in him. But he goes up anyway, still very bravely, against the green knight, and here is what happens. So he encounters the green knight, and they, they meet together, and the green knight spoke. God guard you, Gawain. Welcome to my world after all your wandering. You have timed your arrival like a true traveler to begin this business which binds us together. Last year, at this time, what was yielded became yours, and with new year come you are called to account. We are very much alone, beyond view in this valley. No person to part us. We can do as we please. Pull your helmet from your head and take what you're owed. Show no more struggle than I showed myself when you severed my spine with a single smite. No, said good Gawain, by my life-giving God, I won't gripe or begrudge the grimness to come. So keep to one stroke and I'll stand stock still. Won't whisper a word of unwillingness or one complaint. He bowed to take the blade and bared his neck and nape. But loath to look afraid, he feigned a fearless state. That's a heartbreaking line to me because, of course, right, these grand and noble heroes. Gawain is so human, even though he is also this knight, right? And, and really, the, he's the hero, right? He's, he's the archetypal hero in some ways. Um, but he's also so human because cor courage, as we know, does not mean never being afraid. It means saddling up even though you are afraid. And so he feigned a fearless state. Suddenly the green knight summons up his strength, hoists the axe high over Gawain's head, lifts it aloft with every fiber of his life, and begins to bring home a bone-splitting blow. Had he seen it through as thoroughly as threatened, the man beneath him would have met with his maker. But glimpsing the axe at the edge of his eye, bringing death earthwards as it arced through the air, and sensing its sharpness, Gawain shrank at the shoulders. The swinging axeman swerved from his stroke, and reproached the young prince with piercing words. Call yourself good Sir Gawain, he goaded, who faced down every foe in the field of battle, but now flinches with fear at the foretaste of harm. Never have I known such a namby-pamby knight. Did I budge or even blink when you aimed the axe, or carp or quibble in King Arthur's castle, or flap when my head went flying to my feet? But entirely untouched, you were terror-struck. I'll be found the better fellow, since you were so feeble and frail. Gawain confessed, I flinched at first, but will not fail. Though once my head's unhitched, it's off for once and all. So this goes on for three strikes, and the flinching, right, is, again, this uh, imperfection that Gawain can't actually see it all the way through. Um, but he's, the, the knight uh, swings twice and does not connect, and then he swings once and nicks him. And then this sudden uh, third anticlimax weird moment, right, uh, in, in this weird moment, the question is, what's going on? Well... Surprise, it turns out the Green Knight is Bertilak. Bertilak uh, has Morgan Le Fay in his house, who was trained by the wizard Merlin um, and who knows magic and has basically engineered, helped him to engineer this whole game. Um, and it's almost like an object lesson. It's taught him, it, it's, it's taught Gawain things. And he goes home um, with this new sense of his humanity, his frailty, his brokenness, um, but not... As, and this is what I started this whole series by saying. He does not then say, oh, all my ideals were bunk. He says, oh, I realize that I too am flawed and, and fallen. He says, no wonder if a fool should fall for a female and be, wiped by his, and be wiped of his wits by womanly guile. It's the way of the world. 
Adam fell for a woman, and Solomon for several, and as for Samson, Delilah was his downfall, and afterwards David was bamboozled by Bathsheba and bore the grief, all wrecked and ruined by their wrongs, if only we could love our ladies without believing their lies. And those were fellows from fortunate families, excellent beyond all others existing under heaven, he cried, yet all were charmed and changed by wily womankind. I suffered just the same, so clear me of my crime. So Gawain is coming to realize something here. He's coming to realize that he, what sets him apart from other men, is not that he's somehow perfect. He is flawed. He is broken. He suffers uh, all the same things that even heroes of scripture suffer, right? Um, and this is why the church, right, when it goes wrong, when it makes these things out to be, right, these, these hard and fast rules and falling short of them means that you are dirty and broken and ugly. No, no, we're all dirty and broken and ugly. And the right stance of the church, the stance that the church seems to have taken during this period is yes, we fall, but then we get back up and we, we try very hard. We try our level best with 110% of us uh, to live up to our ideals, to the ideals of chastity and virtue. Um, but when we fall, we try again. And Gawain masterfully, beautifully brings the green girdle home with him to Arthur's court and adopts it as a symbol of his brokenness, not because he's not going to keep living by the chivalric code, but because he wants a reminder that he does so by grace alone. So remember that this girdle, right, is, is a kind of, uh, is, is itself a symbol of, of Gawain's faithlessness because he took, he took it from this lady and it means not trusting wholly in God. So, so Gawain returns home. He says to the court, regard, said Gawain, grabbing the girdle, through this I suffered a scar to my skin. For my loss of faith, I was physically defaced. What a coveting coward I became, it would seem. I was tainted by untruth, and this, its token, I will drape across my chest till the day I die. For man's crimes can be covered, but never made clean. Once entwined with sin, man is twinned for all time. The king gave comfort, then laughter filled the castle, and in friendly accord the company of the court allowed that each lord belonging to their order, every knight in the brotherhood, should bear such a belt, a bright green belt worn obliquely to the body, crosswise like a sash, for the sake of this man. So that slanting green stripe was adopted as their sign, and each knight who held it was honored forever. As all meaningful writings on romance remind us, an adventure which happened in the era of Arthur, as the chronicles of this country have stated clearly. Since fearless Brutus set foot on these shores, once the siege and assault at Troy had ceased, our coffers have been crammed with stories such as these. Now let our Lord, thorn-crowned, bring us to perfect peace. Amen. Oniswa qui mal y pense, and that's the slogan of the Order of the Garter, as I mentioned in the last episode. Shame be to those who think ill of it. Note that we come back here full circle, right, to the founding of the world, to Troy and all of this. But note also, right, that this is a depiction of what knightly camaraderie means, right? He, Gawain comes back with this deep new sense of what it means to be fallen and the tragedy of that and the longing and the yearning and the sadness that we don't always live up to our ideals because this is why it's more painful. It's more painful to have ideals than not to. And this is why scrapping them is so tempting, why people come up with all sorts of reasons not to, not to have them. And yet, right, the pain of it is part of the story and, and the redemption, right, is part of what the King Arthur's court now carries around its, uh, around its body. And, and the laughter of the court is really beautiful to me because these are these men, these comrades in arms, right, who see what this young man has, has realized and maybe have a little bit more world wisdom themselves, um, but take upon themselves all the, this confession of sin, even though it's Gawain's sin, right, that he flinched, he took the girdle, he got this scar from it. Nevertheless, right, they will all proclaim that this is who they are and, and still they pursue the chivalric ideal. I love this poem so much. I hope you do too. If you haven't ever read it before, uh, I hope you enjoyed this journey through it. Uh, that's it for now. Let's do the mailbag. Hey, you, I would like to give you a free shirt. This is real. I want to give you a free we're reading Homer and Screw You t-shirt. This is some of my favorite Young Heretics merch. You can buy it at the shop, but in the month of July, you will get it for free if you become an annual VIP. 
at youngheretics.com slash locals. If you don't know what locals is, then I think you've probably been living under a rock. However, let me tell you, it is the next big thing in social media and in community building. And the VIPs on locals are my nightly court. And there are uh, knights and ladies in it, both, of course. If you are not a VIP or if you're a monthly VIP and you just want to upgrade, either way, go to youngheretics.com slash locals, become an annual member for 56 bucks a year and then screenshot your receipt and send it to promo at youngheretics.com. The first 50 people who do that in the month of July will get a free We're Reading Homer t-shirt. Um, and of course, everybody who does that will get all the amazing benefits of being a Young Heretics VIP. So one more time, head to youngheretics.com slash locals to take advantage of this. One of the benefits of being a VIP is you get to ask mailbag questions. So here is one from Tyler. Hello, Curator of Culture and Minister of Muscles. Thank you very much. That is one of my uh, titles as Scion of the Claven Realm. Um, as an American, my perception of our culture has historically told the story of the youthful, rebellious nature being harnessed to find individual success and innovation of institutions to keep them from stagnating and decaying. With the near year and a half of governmental force we've seen exerted on the citizens, and how the youthful have not only gone along with the mandates, but at times demanded them of others as well, where has that rebellious energy gone towards? Legend tells a Clavin's answers are 100% correct, so I look forward to your analysis of our country's youth. Well, the kids are not all right. That's certainly true. And I, here's something I would say. You're absolutely right about the rebellious sort of thumb your nose attitude of American youth. This was part of the 60s as much as it was part of the founding generation. And obviously I have very different opinions of the American founding than I do of the sexual revolution. Um, but this is, this is part of our spirit and our culture that we believe, I mean, when I talk about Huckleberry Finn, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, right? That there's something in the American spirit which suspects, I think it's a Protestant thing. I think, I think this comes from our Protestant background, um, that we kind of root for the underdog and we root for the young rebel and we, and we think that maybe he has some intuition, something to gain, something to teach us uh, from striking out on his own. It saddens me greatly when... I see that trained out of our youth. And I think that's what it is. I talk a lot on this show about the shaping of the soul that is early education and the development of thumos, which is the middle part of the soul in Plato's sort of famous tripartite scheme. So you have your reason and your thinking, you have your just sort of appetites and your impulses, and then connecting those two, use, you know, it, it, the thumos is like the force, the force of anger, the force of energy, the force of um, passion and, and spirit and courage, right? Your thumos, uh, when it's harnessed by, log by logic, by reason, your thumos directs all your appetites in just the ways we've been talking about these past two episodes, right? Sure, sexual appetite exists. Sure, the martial impulse exists. How is the church, how is the state going to teach young people? Uh, how is the family going to teach young people to channel those impulses? And frankly, I think that after the exhausting horrors of the 20th century and two world wars, even though America was spared this to some extent, but we still got involved, right? Two, two world wars. We just didn't think it was worth it anymore. <laughs> Remember when I talked about how ideals hurt because you fall short of them? I, I, I suspect uh, that this idea that we had in the late 20th century, and still some people have, like in Davos at the World Economic Forum, they kind of have this idea that we're going to move past all the barbarism of the old world, right? Um, and we're just going to have peace now, and we're going to do negotiations. And look, I want peace. I want uh, civilization. I want all of those things. Um, but I don't want us to enforce that at the expense of the existence of, of Thumos. And it seems to me that what we decided to do was just to shave down Thumos and to suppress it and medicate it away. But I mean, a lot of the over-medication of boys especially, it's not to say that all uh, medication of this kind is bad, but when they keep diagnosing all of these boys with ADHD, right, sometimes I feel like, well, they're, they're kind of just medicating 
masculinity, you know, um, and, and the, the, that, that fractious energy, that energy that needs to be channeled, right? We just decided it was too risky. Um, and that has been going on for decades. And so when we came around, yeah, to things like coronavirus, I thought it was really uh, telling that, that people submitted so meekly. But it's not just coronavirus. Actually, something that I have thought about a lot, uh, but not really talked about too much, is that when you read the early books of the sort of um, what, what came before Black Lives Matter BLM, which was this, this rhetoric about the prison industrial complex, that this kind of really fallacious idea that the state just wants to jail black people because it can't enslave them anymore, um, comes out of the fact that there are a lot of problems with crime in black communities, right? Um, and if you read, for example, The New Jim Crow by uh, Michelle Alexander, I think her name is, and it's one of the great founding texts of this idea, um, it's a book that I find really badly argued. But she does say, she does point out that in the inner cities, when the war on drugs started, um, young men didn't know their rights. They didn't know that they could refuse search and seizure um, if it happened without a warrant, right? And people, the same way at coronavirus, right? They, we didn't know, uh, so many people didn't know that if there was a police barricade on the highway to stop people from leaving their homes, you have a right, you have a right as an American, and you should have an instinct as an American to say, am I being detained? That's it, just keep asking that question, right? And the fact, the fact that this is a problem in so many areas of our life, right, suggests to me that we have sanded down that American instinct, uh, which is a youthful spirit of like, who, who the F is you, right? Who the hell are you to tell me what to do? Um, and it's one of the things that I, I think really want us to learn again is to have a default of, well, what right do you have? What right do you have to tell me? And really, that's the founding idea of this country, right? That men are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. And so when somebody comes and makes a very good argument why you shouldn't have the right to free exercise of religion, well, you might cough on somebody and they might get sick, right? It doesn't matter how good that argument is, right? This is what we have to regain, that we've been gulled and coaxed out of it by all of these sophistical arguments, right? But the point of an unalienable right is it's unalienable. That is, God gave it to you, and nobody can come up with some reason why you don't have it. So to me, what we need to train, in addition to all this classical education stuff, right, the reason I advocate things like sports teams for boys, or Boy Scouts, um, and physical education, all of this stuff I'm very big on, the reason for that is that that gets you back in that mindset of like, hey, who are you? Who are you to dunk on me? Who are you to tell me what to do? And it's a crucial, a central component of real classical education, which as I always say, is not just ideas, it's shaping the soul. Thank you for that question, Tyler. I hope the answer was helpful. Thank you for being a VIP. If you are not a VIP, come join us. It's wonderful. You will love it. Youngheretics.com slash locals. Sign up for the annual membership. Okay, that's it for this week. It's always a joy to be with you. If you haven't already, please spread the word about this podcast. Get this message out there. I really believe uh, that it is important. Uh, you, can, you can give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe. You can hit the little bell button on YouTube and subscribe there where you get all the notifications. Um, and just tell people. Tell people about it. If you like this show, you will love the Claremont Institute. They are my gracious employers. Uh, I work for them in, at two publications, the Claremont Review of Books, which is a dead tree book review, comes out four times a year, and the American Mind, which is an online publication uh, and also puts out podcasts of its own. If you would like to support our work in service of and recovery of the American ideal, go to claremont.org slash donate and let them know in the notes that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics. That's it for this time. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.